talk about steps five, six, and seven. We talked about step one on Monday, looked at the powerlessness and how it relates to the physical allergy and the unmanageability and how that relates to the mental obsession, that thing that keeps me drinking and using whether I like it or not. We talked about step two, where I'm coming to believe that a power greater than myself can remove that mental obsession and restore me to sanity, because that's the sanity we're talking about, is the, being, removing the insanity of the first drink, the first drug. And then we talked about step three, where I'm turning my will and my life, which is my thoughts and my actions, over to the care of a higher power. And how my thinking is based on my spiritual condition, and my actions and emotions are based on my thinking, and the, more, the better connection I have to a higher power, the more my thinking is clear, or my actions are effective. And yesterday we talked about step four, where we're doing the searching and fearless moral inventory, which is really just an examination of all the ways we don't do the third step. So once I've finished my inventory, that takes me to step five, which is admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So in the big book on page 72, it says, having made our personal inventory, what should we do about it? We've been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship to our creator, and to discover the obstacles in our path. We've admitted certain defects. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on our part, which when completed, will mean we've, com uh, we've admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the pre preceding chapter. Then it goes on to say, in the understatement of the year, this is perhaps difficult especially discussing our defects with another person. We think we've done well in admitting these things to ourselves. There is doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. So, so I've done my inventory, and now I have to sit down and read it to another person. This is scary. You know, the first three steps I just do in my head. It's me alone just thinking about the first three steps, really. I mean, I'm talking to my sponsor a little bit, I'm going to a few meetings, but it's really me thinking about those steps. Step four is the first step where there's any action involved, but it's still just me, riding my inventory by myself. Step five is the first time that, that I'm actually required to do something that involves another human being, and that's scary for a little bit. Step five requires that I trust my sponsor in order to read him all this stuff. I, I've got to trust him. Now, how many of you guys would say you have some trust issues? Yeah, yeah. Almost all of us have trust issues when we're getting sober, and it's because we don't have the first freaking idea how trust actually works. You know, I've been bestowing trust upon you because I want something from you, not because you've ever demonstrated trustworthiness. You know, like, here's my 60 bucks. I trust you'll come back in a minute and bring me my drugs. I know we just met. <laughs> But that's not how trust works. Trust isn't something I bestow on you, it's something that you demonstrate. You show me who you are over and over and over again, and I can trust that that's who you're gonna keep being. That, that works on both ends of the scale. If you show up and do what you say you're gonna do over and over again, I can trust that that's who, what you're gonna do next time. And if you lie and flake out and lie and flake out and lie and flake out, I can trust that that's what you're gonna do next time too. But with my sponsor, I've been working with this person for a few weeks now, probably, and every time we make an appointment to get together, they show up. And every time I call, they answer, or they call me back. And they take time out of their life for reasons I don't fully understand, and they always do what they tell me they're going to. So by the time I get ready to start doing step five, I, I'm just bare, I trust them just barely enough to actually make a start on reading my inventory. Now that's the way most of the steps work. It's not that I'm completely comfortable in taking the action I'm getting ready to have to take. I'm just barely ready to start trying. But that's enough. So what are the benefits of doing step five with another person? Why can't I just do the inventory on myself and read it and look at it and that's all, yay, we're good. Well, there are a few. The first, doing my fifth step with another person is the beginning of the end of the isolation and loneliness that's been the hallmark of my addiction. They talk about addiction as a disease of loneliness. 
But if it was really loneliness that we were experiencing, going where people are would make it better. And it totally doesn't. Now there's nothing more confusing and painful than being in a whole room full of people and feeling disconnected from every one of them. That's confusing, and I don't know how to deal with it, and it's why a lot of us spend a lot of time drinking and using by ourselves. Because at least when I'm alone, it's supposed to feel lonely. What we're experiencing isn't loneliness, it's spiritual disconnection. And as I take the step, and I talk to my sponsor, a connection forms between us that I haven't had with another human being in a while, probably. The spiritual growth that I um, experience in the process of doing step five allows for that connection to be made. And that the cool thing is, once I'm done with step five, most of us, we're going to some meetings, you know, we're going, okay, they drink and use like me, okay, maybe I belong here, but I still feel a little bit out on the edges of things, like maybe I don't really belong here. And then, then I do my fifth step with my sponsor, and I make that connection with him, the next time I go to a meeting, I feel more connected to those people too. It's building this connection with other people, starting with my sponsor. The next thing that I get is courage. I gain courage by having faith in this process and taking the action and doing the fifth step. I think some of the great minds of our time are writing screenplays and song lyrics as opposed to novels and poetry. And there's a movie um, called Three Kings from the, around 2000 with uh, George Clooney and Ice Cube and it's about the first Gulf War. And there's a scene in it where they're getting ready to go into a firefight, <coughs> excuse me, and there's this 18 year old kid and he's afraid. And Clooney looks at him and goes, well, you, how it works is you do the thing you're afraid of and you get the courage after. And the kid says, that sucks. He's going, yeah, I know, but that's how it works. And that is how it works. I do the thing I'm afraid of, and I gain the experience that it goes okay, especially if the thing I'm afraid of is taking a step and trusting God. If I trust God, I take the step, I gain the experience that it goes well, and I have courage for next time I have to do that thing. It's not as scary next time because I've already done it before. So I get this courage from leaning into this process. And one of the things I get back from that is I realize that my sponsor and therefore maybe the rest of the people in the program really do kind of understand what it's like to be me. How confusing it was and all the stuff I've done. The third thing that I get is humility. We have humility and humiliation confused typically. Humility doesn't mean small. It means right-sized. Now in the beginnings of the program, we talk about humility a lot, and when we're talking about it, we're meaning stop trying to do God's job and just do yours. But there's another side to humility that I get from this fifth step process. The big book says that most alcoholics lead a dual life. And that doesn't mean, you know, I'm somebody else at home and I'm out when the, in the public. What it means is, I don't show you who I really am. How many of you guys have ever had the thought, if they knew who I really was, they'd never have anything to do with me? Because that's where I lived for a long time. Like I always say, my thinking's based on my spiritual condition. So my opinion of me is based on my spiritual condition, which is typically not good. My opinion is based on my spiritual condition, and your opinion of me is based on your actual experience with me. One of those is more accurate. But I think I'm a terrible person. I believe it in my heart. And so I put on a show. I can't let you see who I think I really am, so I put on a show. My sponsor calls it the great and powerful Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. For me, it's the Chris show. I'm putting on the Chris show. And if you like me, I don't think you like me. I think you like the Chris show. I fooled you. You'd never like me. So I have to keep putting on the Chris show or you won't like me anymore. And if you love me, that's 10 times as bad. Because I've fooled you somehow. And if I ever stop dancing, you'll leave. You'll see the truth and you'll leave. And I never feel connected to anybody because I'm putting on that show. But when it comes time to do my fifth step, I can't do that. 
I can't afford to do it. My life's on the line. So I have to show up and just be who I am. 360 degrees, warts, character defects and all, Chris. And just be who I am and read my inventory. And shockingly, my sponsor doesn't run screaming out of the room. And I'm accepted for who I am. But for my purposes, like, I, I've, I didn't put on the show, and he was okay with it. And nothing I talked about over the course of my fifth step seemed all that weird to him. In fact, he seems to have done a lot of the same stuff as me. We have a remarkable ability to pick sponsors who have incredibly similar pasts as ours, even though we don't know that when we ask them. But I get to have that humility of just showing up and being me without trying to put on a show. The fourth one is accountability. Everything I discover in my fourth and fifth step, I'm going to be that exact same person next time I get spiritually unfit. We're creatures of habit. We do the same stuff over and over and over again. So now that my sponsor knows what, that, what my version of that stuff looks like, he can help me spot it when I'm starting to fall back into it and help me course correct before it gets too bad again. You know? Accountability scares me as an addict, but this is a, this is a very positive thing. Because a lot of times, I don't know I'm doing it. I'm just going about my business, doing what feels familiar, and my sponsor goes, what's up with, you didn't call me back twice. That's, a, that's a, something you do, what's going on with you? How are you doing? And I tell him, I'm fine, and then tomorrow I'm totally not. <laughs> but he saw something. And then the last bit is objectivity. I can be trying to be as thorough and honest as I possibly can be. But sometimes I've been telling stories about the world for so long that I don't even know I'm telling them anymore. And my delusion can follow me right into the fourth step. But when I start telling the story to my sponsor who doesn't know the story it's based on, he can see it for what it is. And go, what? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know? And I need that objectivity. After I do the fifth step, and I want to say this out loud because sometimes people don't know, a fifth step will take anywhere from three to six hours, typically. And I say that because there was a girl here a, a while back who had finished her fourth step, and she was very thorough, and I came across her one day with a red pencil crossing stuff out. And I'm what are you doing? And she said, well, my sponsor's coming to do my fifth step, and I've got to make sure this all fit in an hour. I said, why do you think she's coming for an hour? And she said, well, that's how long she comes, came for every other time she came. And I just told her, no, 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 you're reading all of this. Your sponsor knows this is going to take a while. She's cleared the decks for you, I promise. So once I finish this process, I go home and I do the second half of the fifth step. On page 75, it says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we've done. We thank God from the bottom of our hearts that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask ourselves if we've omitted anything. For we're building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? So it's a real good idea to follow these instructions exactly. Now think about it, just on a practical terms. I just spent four or five hours digging through my weird, embarrassing, shameful past. It's probably a good idea to go somewhere and sit and be quiet for a while. And let that sort of move through me and out of me. And get re-centered. If you can't go, if going home isn't a quiet place, find somewhere that is. And go spend a little bit of time being quiet. And then do exactly what it says and pull the book down from the shelf and turn to the page with the steps on it. And once you do that, you can look at the first step and ask yourself, do I believe, based on my own drinking and using history, that I'm an addict or an alcoholic? Do I see signs of the phenomenon of craving in my past? Do I see signs of that mental obsession? Do I believe? Do I understand what that means? If I have doubts, any lingering notion at all, this is the time when I should call my sponsor and talk to them about it. That's not a failure, it's not a shameful, it's not anything else. That's why this review is here. Is my work solid so far? If I've got doubts about my first step, I should talk to somebody before I move forward. That's why the review's here. 
Then I look at the second step and ask myself, am I coming to believe that a power greater than myself can remove the mental obsession so that I can stay sober without struggling? Am I, am I believing that the reason I'm not struggling with that obsession right now is because a higher power is acting in my life? Am I gaining more experience? And do I still, am I in the process of coming to believe? The only way to really believe something is to have a whole bunch of experience. At this point, I don't have a whole bunch of experience. I have like a month or something. But I'm still in the process of coming to believe that, that this is a sustainable situation as long as I stay spiritually fit. Now look at the third step. Have I begun to try to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand it? The simple fact that the first action based on that decision is a fourth step, and I did that, and five, means I've made a start. Then I look at step four and ask myself, was I as thorough as it's possible to be at this moment in time where I am on the path? Did I leave stuff off my inventory? Absolutely. There's stuff that I'm not ready to think about, that my mind isn't capable of coming up with when I'm a month or six weeks sober. But as long as I didn't leave it off on purpose, that's fine. You'll do another fourth step in a few months. You'll think of stuff that you... How did I not think of that last time? Because where I was last time, I wasn't capable. So after I look at the fourth step, I look at step five. Was I as thorough as I could be with step five, too? You know, maybe I wrote everything down, but as I began reading it to my sponsor, I took a look at one of them and went, well, I'm not telling him that one. Not doing it. You know, and if I left something off, I need to call him right now and read him the one I skipped. Because secrets keep me separate. Secret, secrets make me sick. You know, this thing that I'm refusing to tell him, I'm making a big deal out of it. And it, it's, you guys can't know or else you won't let me come. And I promise, whatever the worst thing on your fourth step is, it's not the worst thing anybody's ever heard. I promise. So after I've gone through this, I've spent the hour, I've looked at my work, and if you're like me, I was like, I'm, just, I'm certain I'm screwing this up. I'm certain I'm screwing this up. My life's on the line. I'm certain I'm screwing it up. And my sponsor would call me down and go, but have you done the best work you can? Well, I guess. Okay. I'm not skimping on purpose. I'm not just trying to check boxes. I'm, I'm trying to do this the best I can. And that's the main thing. And then that takes me to step six, which is we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. On page 76, the book says, if we can answer to our satisfaction that we've, that we've uh, done the best we can on the first five steps, if we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. Just a couple of quick sentences about the sixth step in the big book. In the 12 and 12, it says, this step separates the men from the boys. What this step really does is it separates the people who say they want their life to be different from the people who are actually willing to do something about making their life different. Am I really willing to let my higher power come in and help me act a different way? Or am I going to just keep doing the same stuff I've always done and get the same results? Because if nothing changes, nothing changes. I'm always ahead of that. People go, well, things change. And in my experience, not unless you do something about them. <laughs> not, not, not for the better. <laughs> you know, yeah, things change. Never for the better unless I'm actively trying to make them better. But now I have that ability, and that's what step six is doing. Am I, am I going to let my higher power come in? Am I going to let him put some, some gas in my spiritual tank so that my thinking can get better and my actions can get better? It all, in the 12 and 12, it also says, on page 65, it says, the sixth step is AA's way of stating the best possible attitude one can take in order to make a, a beginning of this lifetime job. So in a lot of ways, I'm still doing my original sixth step. I'm still becoming willing to have God remove these defects because I still have a lot of the defects. They're smaller, and they're coming out in much more functional ways, but they're still there. You know, the, the glaring stuff that I was doing that was keeping me cut off from God and high has, has been removed. You know, the huge dishonesty has been removed. Now it's just little dishonesties, but it's still dishonest and I'm still growing. That's fine. It's a lifetime job. It's okay. 
So once again, trying to understand this, character defects, I'm not a mass of inescapable defects. I don't believe God made any of us broken. What I am is a person who tends to get spiritually unfit fairly quickly. I was talking earlier with somebody about some are sicker than others, and I used to think that means the people who kept relapsing were sicker than me. But the truth is, I'm one of the sick ones. I get spiritually unfit at the drop of a hat. And then my character defects come up once I start getting spiritually disconnected. They're a response to poor spiritual condition. They're not ingrained in my personality. So I become willing to let God remove them because I can't just wish them away. I can't do, do the inventory, see that my character defects, and then just go be a better guy. That's not, it doesn't work. I tried. I wanted to be a good guy. When push came to shove, I turned into the same jerk. So I'm doing step six. I'm becoming entirely ready. It's a much more practical pen to paper process as a part of step 10. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we'll talk about it more next week when we're talking about step 10. But for now, I come home. I look at the work I've done so far. Then I ask myself, am I ready to start letting my higher power come in and act in my life so that I can stop being the person that I just discovered over my fifth step. Because I don't want to be that guy anymore. Especially if it means I might have to go start drinking and using again. I don't want to be that guy anymore. I'd like to be the man I was born to be, if it's at all possible. And so I'm becoming willing. You know? And there are things that scare me, but like, you know, some people say, you know, the way you can tell God's removed a defect from me is it's covered in scratch marks from trying to get it out of my hands. But all this is a process. Over time, they gradually keep going away, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And then I move to step seven, which says, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. The first question is, why am I humbly asking God to remove my shortcomings? Once again, this goes back to the definition of humility we were talking about earlier, right size, owning my, what I can and can't do. And I'm asking God to remove my defects because I can't remove them. I can't just go be a good boy now that I know what they are. Just don't be selfish no matter how scared you get. <laughs> Sorry. And God, I remember all the way back being 10 years old at Bible study before church, Sunday school. And they're talking to us about the golden rule. And I remember as a 10-year-old thinking, wow, that's a great idea. I'll never be able to do that. Because I was already spiritually unfit at 10. So now I'm humbly asking God to remove these defects. All it really talks about on the seventh step in the big book is the prayer. My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. I love the seventh step prayer. I like that the first thing it says is here I am, good and bad. Not just bad, good and bad. Turns out a lot of the things that I discovered on my fifth step that were causing me so much problems were strengths that I was using the wrong way. I'm a very, very loyal person. But after a certain point, when you mix loyalty with malady, it becomes codependency and it was killing me. I'm an incredibly resourceful person. I've been able to put together things and make things happen that guys like me should never be able to make happen. I mean, Christ, I moved to Los Angeles in the mid-80s and formed a rock band and got a record deal when everybody else was dressing like girls and looking like Aerosmith. And I show up looking like me and the spandex don't come in a 38 waist. And I still managed to get that done. But that resourcefulness nearly killed me trying to solve my addiction problem on my own. So we find these things, these instincts that are God-given, that we're using the wrong way, trying to get the wrong things from. It's not all bad. We're just doing some of it wrong. So here I am, God, good and bad. Prayer's making me own the good. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Bless their hearts. I hear people in meeting all the time going, well, this defect must be useful to somebody because God's not taking it. 
which is a great way to sound spiritual without actually having to try to be a better person. <laughs> that's, some, that's some nonsense. Simple truth is, all of my defects stand in the way of my maximum usefulness to God and my fellows. All of them. Now that doesn't mean they're going to magically be whisked away. But the only way my defects are any help to you is as a cautionary tale. And my days of having to be that guy, your days of having to be the person that people point at and go, don't be them, those are over if I'm willing to let them be. And I would love for all of, the, all of them to, well, I say I would love for all my defects to just go away, but I'm, I would have no defenses against the world if they did. So, but they go slowly, and I, grow, and I keep growing spiritually, and they, my need for them falls away. Grant me strength as I go from here to do your bidding. This is restating the solution. If I'm going to be what God would have me be, I'm going to need God's help doing it. I have a sponsee. He's just like me. I was talking to him not long ago, and he's got an incredibly rich and full life. He's about six years sober, and he's a young cat, mid six, mid twenties, and uh, he's, has a very busy life. And he's showing up, and he's doing everything right. And then we were talking about it, and he realized that. He's going out there and being what God would have him be without ever asking God for help to do that. And it's exhausting. You know, it's just exhausting trying to go be a good guy all the time without asking God to go with me. You know, I don't, this is my, it's not my job to go be a better person. It's my job to ask God to help me. And the better person happens. You know, it, I've done it. That's why I was laughing because he started telling me about it. I knew exactly what it was because, man, have I done that. I'm going out there and I'm being what God would have me be all on my own power. And it's, it is exhausting. But if I remember to say a prayer now and then and go, hey, next half an hour, help carry me through because this is a pain. And the next thing I know, it's two hours later and I'm not tired. You know, I do it all the time. So grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding because I'm going to need your strength not more than just my own. So in practical terms, seventh step, five, six, and seven. I've done my inventory. We're going to talk about them sort of as a part of step 10, so you get a picture of what the point is. And one of the guys who I really respect out there in the program talks about the reason step six and seven move so quickly is because I've been... I've been in my house up to now, right? I'm, in, I'm at home doing steps one, two, and three, and I do step four at home, and then my sponsor comes over, and we do step five at my house. But in step eight and nine, I'm getting ready to go out into the world. And I don't want to spend too long thinking about that. I need to get on with it. So I just go home and do six and seven in that hour, and we move forward. Typically, the best way to approach it is that if I do five, six, and seven on a Saturday, I should be meeting with my sponsor by Monday or Tuesday and showing him the beginnings of my eight-step list. And I should be making amends before the end of the week. There's a momentum to spiritual growth. There is a momentum to the step work. And if you let very much time lapse between some of the steps, they become so scary that you stop and don't do them. You know, if you let very much time lapse really between admitting you're an alcoholic and starting to write the inventory, you won't write the inventory. So there's a momentum to this. And I want to keep moving. So I do five, six, and seven in a day, which is awesome. I finished a quarter of the steps in one day. But I want to move into step eight pretty quick so that I can move into step nine before I lose my momentum. But getting to see how this works as part of the larger picture, as a part of a step 10, because step 10 is four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine on a daily basis as things arise. So somebody does something that upsets me, makes me angry, hurts my feelings, whatever causes me to become spiritually unfit. If I just sit around and do nothing about that, something else will affect me in a couple of hours that wouldn't have affected me otherwise, but now I'm twice as spiritually unfit. I get all sticky once I'm spiritually unfit and everything bothers me. When that first thing happens, I could pause once I recognize, the book says pause when agitated or doubtful. I recognize, oh, you just did something that agitated me. And what I do in that pause is I do inventory. And I run something through the columns. And when I get to that fifth column, and I see the exact nature of my wrongs, how was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, 
and consider it unrealistic. What were the defects that caused my behavior in this situation? My part. Then I can take what I found in step six, in, step five, in that fifth column, I mean, and walk it into step six. I can talk to my sponsor about it if I need to, but the goal is to go into step six and imagine what it would look like to be the opposite of the defects I just, I just, uh, just acted on. So wh what would it look like to be unselfish instead of selfish? Honest instead of dishonest. God-seeking instead of self-seeking. Courageous instead of frightened. What would my behavior look like, specifically me, in that situation if I were unselfish and God-seeking and courageous and honest? What would I look like? Because I can't be entirely ready for God to remove something unless I know what's going to take its place. And so I get this vision. I'll do it in writing. I'll do my inventory, run through the columns, and then I'll take the first part of the page and fold it over and look at the defects and write down what I think the step six is. So I know exactly what I'm asking God for me to help be in step seven. Because life happens over and over and over and over. And I've got to get better at it. And this process of four, five, six, and seven specifically is how I begin to course correct and how I begin to do that. You know, I talk about it all the time. I'll do a quick one. That's my part and the defect. Okay. I got a couple of daughters. They've been out of high school for a year and a half now. They're supposed to be enrolling in college. They're actively not doing that. And every time I go home and see that pile of stuff that they're supposed to be taking care of, I get a little agitated. I get a little afraid, really. I want it to be a resentment, but it really is fear. This affects my emotional security, my pocketbook, my ambitions, personal relations, with them at least, my emotional security because there's this thing that I can't do anything about that's scaring me, a pocketbook because I would like to not be paying their rent when they're 30, my ambitions for them to have a successful life and not be dependent on me. My personal relations with them, because as I get agitated because of their behavior, I'm likely to act like an idiot, be hard to talk to, which is not helpful for them. My part, well, I haven't done anything yet, but in the past, I get angry, a little bit loud, not even really yelling or anything. I'm just, they call it demonstrative. I'm speaking loudly and I'm moving my arms. And I'm being frightened and self-seeking and unrealistic. Frightened because what they're, I think what they're doing might affect my comfort and my future. I'm frightened because I'd hate for them to struggle the way I had to struggle. I'm self-seeking because I want them to do what I want them to do because I think it'll make me feel better. It'll be good for them too, but that's neat. And unrealistic, because I think if they act a certain way, I'll feel better. But my ability to feel okay doesn't come from them. So I've run these columns. And I talk to my sponsor about it to make sure that I'm right with what I found here. And then I go into step six and ask myself, what would it look like if I were courageous, God-seeking, and realistic in my dealings with my girls? My daughters are five foot even and they, don't, they weigh less than 100 pounds. I'm 6'1", and I weigh more than that. <laughs> and if I get loud or even stern, or even, I could, I could just be very direct. And they start to shut down, even though I've never given them a reason to be afraid of me. They just inherently, because of their size, I don't know what it's not like to be one of the biggest guys in every room I'm in. I have no idea what it's like to be five feet tall and 95 pounds. I have no idea. 
not since grade school. So I don't know what it's like to be them. So I have to be, I have to be aware of who I'm being and how I'm presenting myself if I want to be able to continue to show up and be who they need me to be. So I get this vision. What would it look like if I weren't afraid? Well, then I just ask him what's going on because it doesn't matter. What would it look like if I were God seeking? Well, I might ask God to go with me while I do this and get, help me get a vision of what they're, how I might help them in this process. And unrealistic, both because I think if they act a certain way, I'll feel better, which is, which is delusional, and because I'm wanting them to do things in a way that they're just not quite organized enough to do yet. Now, they may need some more hand-holding. That's okay. Won't happen if I get mad. And how that plays out in a practical sense of the step six is when I talk to them about it, I try and smile. I try and speak softly. I try and be joking about it. I try and make sure I'm in a good spiritual spot before we even begin talking. Because if I'm the least bit agitated, the conversation won't go well. I try and sit down so I'm not standing looming over them. I get this vision. And then I ask God to help me be that person. Because if I could be that guy, I'd just be that guy. But I wasn't that guy at one point, and it didn't go good. And, I, and they need me. They need both their parents to be able to help guide them. You know, I, I, we can't afford to lose the ability to talk with them. And even if this situation clears itself up, they're going to do something else next week. And I still need to be able to show up and be the man God would have me be. So as I get that vision in step six and I ask him to help me be that man in step seven, I begin to make a start on changing how I, react, how I respond to them. And I, I can do that with anything and with anybody in any situation that's not going well. Nothing is too little to run through the columns so I can get a vision of God's will. This four, five, six, and seven, these are the tools that help me course correct. These are the tools that let me help, help me specifically figure out how I should be doing things so I could better be what God wants me to be. I can't just hope for the best. Hoping for the best is the single most dangerous thing an alcoholic can do. I gotta, I gotta have a better plan than that. And this five, six, and seven, do them exactly the way the book says in the first place. Because I don't want to ruin my momentum getting out there into steps eight and nine. But as a part of an ongoing step 10, this is a very practical process for trying to figure out what it would be like to show up and do things right. Oftentimes, I do inventory before the fact. I don't wait to do something wrong. As part of my on awakening, I'll do inventory on things that, are, that worry me during the day so that I can get a vision of God's will before I get there. So I have a better chance of pulling it off right the first time. You know, it's a very simple, practical process. We talk about it like it's the mechanics of spirituality. These are the actions I can take that allow me to stay connected to a higher power and allow me to become the person I always was meant to be and couldn't ever pull off on my own. Especially not if I'm spiritually unfit. <laughs>